Hi, welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This video will basically be the second one in which we'll be looking at the work of Soren Kierkegaard, a early to mid 19th century existential thinker and basically the progenitor of the whole modern existentialist movement. Okay, so um, remember what I told you in the last video that we're, uh, we're exploring a little bit of Kierkegaard as a way of helping you uh, get caught up with your reading assignment from the Rollo May book. So in this video, we'll be looking at the idea of dread or angst or anxiety as it's uh, variously translated in Kierkegaard's work. So I'm going to use the vocabulary of dread. I think that that's a little bit of an older translated term, but it's the one I'm more familiar with. So dread. So uh, first thing you should probably need to know about Kierkegaard's idea of dread is that it's a kind of ontological category. Incidentally, sidebar moment. That's true in general when existentialists take up things like uh, anxiety or angst or the absurd or something like that. Almost always what they end up doing is treating whatever idea it is as a kind of ontological category. So what do we mean by that? What do we mean by ontological category? In other words, what we mean is a basic fundamental structural constituent of existence itself. It's not just that you experience dread every now and then in your life. It's more that existence itself is structured that way and it's because it's structured that way that you can feel that experience of dread in the first place. So um, uh, dread is a kind of ontological category and not a mere experience that you have every now and then. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing is probably, this is going to be a little bit counterintuitive at first, probably. Uh, so how does uh, Kierkegaard think about dread? Well, here's his somewhat oblique way of <laughs> characterizing it. Well, dread is a sympathetic antipathy and an antipathetic sympathy. And it's like, wow, thank you for that stunning bolt of lucidity, Dr. Insight. Now, what does that really mean? Well, in your notes, I rendered it uh, I think somewhat more directly as uh, a fear of what you desire and a desire for what we fear. Okay, so let's kind of say that again to help you get into it. So a fear of what we desire and a desire for what we fear. Or another way of rendering it would be something like this. An attraction to what repels us and a repulsion toward what attracts us. Okay, so this is, like I said, this is probably going to be a little bit counterintuitive because it's a way of problematizing the way we normally think about uh, the relationship between fear and desire or between attraction and repulsion. Okay, and so what he's basically saying is that let's just use the formula of uh, desiring what we fear and fearing what we desire, that uh, the interrelationship between desire and fear is a lot closer than it seems at first. Because at first it seems like, uh, no, we don't really desire what we fear. Uh, we desire the opposite of what we fear. What we fear is what we do not want to happen in our lives. What we desire is what we do want to ha have happen in our lives. And he's saying that at one level that may be true, but at the same time we also desire what we fear and fear what we desire. Okay, so um, because it's a little bit kind of counterintuitive, probably what we should do is, and I'm going to follow Kierkegaard here and use his same example, although I thought of another one too. So uh, his example, uh, to illustrate this idea, has to do with uh, uh, standing at the, high, at the top of a high drop, okay, without a guardrail or anything like that, you know. So if you've ever, whatever, been on top of your roof, if you have a high roof, or a cliff or anything like that, you know, <laughs> and there's no um, guardrail uh, that you can rely upon. Well, you know, most of us get a little kind of queasy or shaky if we get like uh, within a foot or two of that, that ledge. And the question is, well, why is that? And here's the first answer might be that, well, we're afraid of falling off. And that's probably not actually true for most people because for most people uh, they probably know that they have enough physical coordination to keep from simply falling off. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know? So, um, or maybe you think like, well, you know, uh, I'm afraid that a bird might hit my head and make me tumble over the, that, that's not realistic either, okay? <laughs> you know, how many times has a bird hit your head and forced you over the edge of something, whether it's a high height or not? Probably not too many. I've been alive 60 years now, my goodness, they grow up before you know it, and I've never had that happen. So, um, and nor have I ever heard of anyone having that happen. So the point is, what's the point? The point is that it's not really, the fear is not really about uh, physicality, right? It's not really about what we think it is at first, like, well, I might just slip and fall over. It's not really about that. It's about something psychological rather than something physical. The reason why high heights scare us like that. Okay, so unless you're Alex Honnold, perhaps you <laughs> wouldn't be able to relate to this example. But uh, probably even he is afraid of something. So, um, okay, so what is uh, the difference? So in your notes I said, what's the difference between uh, standing on the edge of a six inch drop, okay, which is, for, you know, like a less than a stair, stair, a step, you know, and a hundred foot drop, okay? Because in both instances, the physical challenge is the same. So why does one freak you out and the other not freak you out? And um, Okay, so uh, the idea, the first idea is the freak out is a, at one level about the fact that part of you knows that it's within the range of your freedom to step over that edge. Okay, so <laughs> that's the scary thing that you could choose to end your life at any and all points, you know. Um, okay, so uh, maybe here it's. Um, you know, good to sort of uh, generalize the example so that you can sort of see it more in everyday life because probably most, most people don't have to go up on high heights all that often. Okay, so let's take another example that's more everyday. Have you ever um, been driving down the highway like here, here in Georgia? Okay, let's say we're going from Carrollton, Georgia, which is where the university is, up to Temple, Georgia on Route 113. Now, Route 113 is a, a two lane, one lane in each direction type road, and it's kind of a high speed road. It's, you know, it's not like the interstate, but I think the speed limit, what is the speed limit? 55 maybe on that road? And you're, so you're driving up this road. Have you ever sort of had a weird moment where you're driving along a road like that, a fairly high speed road, and uh, maybe you see like an 18 wheeler coming the other way, and you have this weird thought that like, wow, you know, I could end my life with a, a quick sort of twitch of my wrist, and that would be it. Game over. And no respawn that we know of. All right. You know, so, um, yeah, that's not a very nice uh, or polite thing. <laughs> this is not the topic of polite conversation. Well, guess what? Existentialists aren't interested in being pol polite. They're interested in being real. So, like, you've had, like, a weird thought like that, and it's like, wow, you know, like, what's the only, what's, what's really keeping me from uh, ending my life on Route 113, driving up to Temple? And so the realization is the only thing keeping you from ending your life is you and your ongoing choices, your ongoing practice of freedom is the only thing keeping you alive on that highway. And if you generalize that even further, probably it's the only keep thing keeping you alive from day to day. Okay, so to, to end your existence is not exactly rocket science in terms of the sort of uh, pragmatic complexities involved. Okay, so the only thing really from keeping you here is you and your ongoing choices. And that's part of what the dread is about, okay? Is that like, it's within your freedom, it's within your powers to radically terminate existence as you know it, your life as you know it. You know, we don't like to think of it this way. We like to think, well, suicide's against the law and that's why I couldn't do it. It's like, well, you could decide that you're not gonna obey that law and plenty of people do, okay? And, world. Plenty of people decide that they're not going to obey that law or those social customs or those uh, biblical uh, prohibitions that would seemingly prevent people from ending their existence. The fact of the matter is you could end your existence at any and all points and there's something dreadful about that, right? That you're responsible in many different ways in this world, but at the root level of your biological continuity, you're responsible there too. And that's part of what the dread is about. Okay, so that's number one. So dread is really about your freedom, okay? 
dread or anxiety is really, the thing you're anxious about is really your freedom. Now, okay, so here's the thing about your freedom. Your freedom and the responsibility that goes with it are really just part of your existence as such. It's really just one aspect or element of your existence as such. So, connect the dots moment. Really what you're dreading or what your anxiety is about is nothing other than the reality of your existence. Okay, so this is why it's an ontological category. You get it? Okay, so the first freak out is about your freedom and that's ultimately about your existence. The second freak out, and this one is a little bit more uh, you know, cutting perhaps, is it's not just that realizing that you're free enough to end your existence is what makes you anxious. The bigger thing, the more anxiety provoking thing, is that part of you might actually want to do that. Okay, a part of you that is perhaps deeper than your conscious awareness and your conscious volition and all of those sorts of capacities, that there may be a part of you that would actually be attracted to that. And this is even less polite to talk about. Okay, so as you're driving down 113, you know, the, the anxious thing is, yeah, okay, I could choose to end my life at any second, but the more anxious thing is part of you might want to. Okay, to do that. And it's like, oh my goodness, this is starting to get kind of creepy. Well, it is creepy, but the thing is, existence is creepy, as one of its many other charms is that it's creepy as hell. Creepy AF, if you'll permit me a slight vulgarity. All right, so at any rate, so um, being attracted to what we fear, in this case, annihilating our existence and uh, fearing what we're attracted to, Fe desiring what we fear and fearing what we desire is uh, really what dread is all about. So uh, there's actually um, a dark side to our desire. <laughs> all right? And this is not just about whatever, you know, serial killers or so someone like that. You know, this is like everyone's desire has a dark side to it. It has an uplifting sort of, you know, constructive side, but it also has a dark destructive side too that you're, uh, that each one of us has, to put it in the, uh, the time-honored words of W. Axel Rose, an appetite for destruction and an appetite for self-destruction too, you know. It's, um, it's part and parcel of our existential lot. It's not polite to talk about it or even to admit it. It's a hard thing to admit it even to ourselves that part of our desire trades in our own dissolution, ultimately. So um, maybe this sort of idea sounds a little bit familiar to you uh, because uh, Freud had a similar idea, the later Freud, in a book called Beyond the Pleasure Principle, uh, when he uh, reformulated his vision of the unconscious, which he did several times throughout his long life, um, in terms of Eros and Thanatos. Okay, so Eros is the sort of uh, life-affirming, constructive impulse part of our unconscious, and Thanatos is the Greek word for death, or one of the Greek words, there's a couple of them. But So uh, Thanatos is the death drive, all right? So that our unconscious, part of our unconscious, is a kind of um, um, a drive toward our own death. And the thing is that at first that seems like such a wild thing. Well, it's not that wild because, you know, the fact of the matter is ever, all of our existence um, ultimately is pointing toward our death ultimately pointing toward our dissolution in a way like our entire sort of uh, motive force in life is driving us day by day toward that ultimate precipice over which we will one day fall. Okay, so uh, at first it seems like this is so kind of strange and weird and probably maybe you don't even want to hear it. And it's like, yeah, um, most people probably don't because it's a difficult scary thing to realize that like part of what you desire in this life is what scares you the most and what scares you the most is part of what you desire you know and uh here's a, here's another thing that might sort of give you pause to reflect on this you ever sort of wonder about um 
you know, uh, like rides like at Six Flags or something like that, like big sort of roller coasters and stuff like that. And if you go on, I, I love to go on those kinds of things. And um, part of the reason why is has to do with this Kierkegaardian insight. It's like, yeah, you know, like the thing that scares you the most probably at Six Flags or something like that is probably the thing you want to go on the most, right? Because it makes you feel alive, you know, like... Uh, you know, it keeps you safe for the most part, and at the same time, you can still feel alive at the same time. Because there's nothing quite like, um, you know, being brought to that real primitive uh, level of life and death teetering in the balance to, uh, to make you feel alive. And the other, uh, maybe I should end this video, this is going to be a relatively short one, I suppose, to realize is that, you know, thinking of... Uh, high heights and uh, cliffs. I used to be into rock climbing when I was young and um, <laughs> you can get scared pretty easily doing stuff like that. And um, one of the things that rock climbing taught me was uh, that actually every moment in your life has its particular cliff. All right. It's just that when you're rock climbing, it's made more obvious, but it's really showing you something that happens throughout your entire lifespan. The fact of the matter is every single moment, even this one when you're watching the video, has its particular perilousness, right? Because why? Because human existence is irreducibly perilous in principle. And the fact of the matter is our continuity here is very unpredictable. You may think you have 50 years or more left. Well, maybe, maybe not. Maybe later today will be your time or mine too. You know, you don't get out of it because you're a professor with a PhD and tenure and all that kind of stuff. In fact, in a way, like having all that stuff makes it worse because, you know, you've read books by people like Kierkegaard and so you're more acutely aware of it than perhaps you otherwise would be. As they say, ignorance is bliss. So, you know, if you think that I'm somehow outside of what I'm trying to describe to you, the ac actually the exact opposite is the case. Every moment, including this one, has its cliff. You're already climbing. You're already on the mountain. Okay, well, with that realization, resounding like thunder in your ears. <laughs> uh, have a good one. Take care.